second, we intend to put across and reiterate the significance of circular economy that has become need of the hour. And we can proliferate this concept not only at industrial level, but also at social and individual level with this series of webinar. In our previous webinar, we discussed the fundamental concepts of circular economy. And now we are moving on to the application and implementation part of it with an objective to generate and promote awareness and gain better understanding about circular economy. So let me begin this webinar uh, with an introduction of a great massive global movement of eco-civilization. And who can be better to talk about it than the curator herself of this movement. So let me invite Violeta Bulls, ma'am, for a brief introduction of eco-civilization. Hello, everyone. Ranji, thank you very much for this great introduction. I'm not going to steal too much of your time because it is too pressure also for me to learn from you uh, about how the circular economy is actually implemented and what are really the hands-on experiences. Um, but uh, just a few sentences that you know that this is part of a broader picture. Uh, last year in March, the first models of eco-civilization uh, after many years of thinking about it and actually setting the foundations in 2012 as part of International System Science Society group uh, for the potential new uh, civilizational paradigm, uh, which we call eco-civilization. They've started in uh, March last year. We started with our talks and gatherings in May. And uh, I can confidently say that now it's uh, already a movement. It's becoming a think tank structure that has many different legs, among them uh, the talks, eco-civilization talks, where we address the paradigms that are typical for civilizational shifts. The next one, for example, is coming on the roots of uh, civilizations in, on um, February uh, 17th at 3 o'clock. Uh, but then Ranji came with this great idea, we need to bring everything closer to the youth and uh, we need to be more hands-on. And that's how the uh, eco-civilization in action was born. Uh, and uh, this is our already our second uh, event, as it was already said. Uh, at the same time, we were uh, able with our colleagues from Africa, especially from the south part of Africa, South Africa, Zimbabwe, uh, then uh, Tanzania and countries in, in that basin uh, launched the year of Ubuntu. It's basically reviving the old wisdoms uh, where uh, we can learn from and integrate with uh, everything that we as a uh, current civilization, which is very much technical based, brought uh, to this overall uh, human society. And I do believe personally that integration is the next way to go. So what is eco-civilization? Uh, basically, it's just a new destination that is inviting us that uh, when we are faced with these fundamental challenges uh, as planet Earth, that we can pull ourselves out of the current structures, out of the predefined mindsets that we've been building up for so long and are now becoming our obstacle in order to see beyond, so this is what eco-civilization offers. It's a new uh, narrative. It's a new uh, sort of shared destination that we are co-creating as we walk, uh, because there is just nobody really can be confident of what the future is. But together, we can co-create it. Uh, so it's very important that we know what we really want. Why uh, are we? part of webinars like this one. Uh, where is the change that we really want to create our own contribution? Uh, so uh, this is something that uh, we are now all part of. So I'm really exciting. I'm really excited to, to offer you uh, this sort of a space where we can safely meet and um, to challenge you a little bit uh, even more. I'll share with you three goals that kind of I invited uh, people that they have in mind when they think about eco-civilization, but by no means uh, this is the predefined structure within which you have to think. But for me, uh, eco-civilization first goal is that we create an um, echo zone out of this incredible planet Earth, the echo zone of our galaxy. 
uh, I know that our curiosity will take us beyond the planet Earth. So when we leave this uh, planet and populate other planets, my uh, real, real wish, deep wish is that we do that out of act of, uh, of uh, humanity at its best, not out of the need to destroy yet another planet, but to create uh, more planets that know the essence of what it means to be alive. So uh, in order to achieve that, um, I do believe we will in the next 30 years uh, bring on board a new physics. We will understand what relationships are all about. And I do feel inside that the new civilizational paradigm will be a lot about relationships, not only among human beings or people uh, and their relationship with everything else around us, but in fundamental principles of what relationship is all about. So that is ahead of us. I'm excited. And now we are bringing all different kinds of incredible minds and hearts together in order to shape the future that we want to live in. And we want to live in with a big smile. So thank you very much. And I wish you a great day. And of course, I will be here listening with uh, great interest. Ranji, back to you. Thank you, Valeta, ma'am, for giving us a brief overview of eco-civilization. And uh, I'm sure that uh, each one of us is aware that uh, uh, circular economy is an integral part of eco-civilization. So now we all are set to bring to, uh, to you the best knowledge on the subject with our veteran industry expert as panel speakers. And without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker of the day, Shiny Scout, who is joining us from Netherlands. Shiny studied industrial design engineering at the to dealt with an annotation in technology in sustainable development. Her circular business model framework that she developed at Philips Kitchen Appliances during her thesis was published in The Guardian. Shaina was one of the lead others of the UN Environment Report, the long view that provides policy recommendation for product lifetime, extension in developed and developing countries. After that, she continued at InnoBoost to work on eight circular cases in different industries for companies with an aim to explore how these companies can take steps forward uh, for circular economy, economy business models through experimentation. In this webinar, Shine will highlight one of these cases and share learning from circular projects at Inobu so far. So over to Shine. Thank you uh, very much uh, for the introduction. I will now share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, everything is fine. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. And uh, also thank you for the great uh, vision uh, uh, speech also about uh, eco-civilization, very inspiring. Uh, so today I will share um, three learnings uh, on taking steps towards a circular economy of what uh, yeah, we've been learning so far uh, at InnoBoost. And Rajdi already gave uh, the same introduction as I was going to uh, give, but it was a great summary. So uh, I was uh, Shaya Schreit, and uh, I indeed studied industrial engineering. Uh, it was on uh, product design and service design, and it was actually one of the most uh, technical uh, masters uh, in industrial design engineering. There are three, and I ended up very uh, strategic. And I will also uh, explain a little bit later uh, why that is. Um, so um, I'm in circular economy on, in this topic, I think for five years now or something. And I also did research to, um, yeah, product lifetime extension with Kanu Bakker uh, uh, for the UN environment. And indeed with InnoBoost, I worked on uh, several uh, cases on how companies can take steps towards a circular economy. And a bit now uh, about InnoBoost, uh, we are a collective on innovation professionals from different backgrounds. Uh, you have um, yeah, branding, uh, you have uh, design thinking, those kind of things. And we're all uh, coming together uh, to leave uh, people and planet better than we found them. So we want to put uh, planet and people at the heart of innovation so we can create a profit uh, 
to be uh, proud of and um, find a way how businesses can be a force uh, for good. And uh, in this journey, uh, we've worked with several companies such as Philips, Bugaboo, uh, Evides, uh, it's a water company, also smaller companies such as Mud Jeans and Fresher. And we looked how all these companies in the different industries uh, can take steps. And uh, we've also developed a framework of it. And uh, this is also done uh, by my co-entrepreneur, uh, Christian Kreienhagen, who also wrote a book about a circular business and will uh, maybe later present uh, also in the next uh, webinar uh, of this uh, to explain more about uh, all the steps. But now I will share some three uh, overall lessons that we learned from the cases and uh, based on my experience uh, on other projects as well. Uh, before going into the learnings, I uh, always like to emphasize to uh, also uh, mind uh, the maybe the international differences. It's, uh, it's one of the things uh, I found um, out when I was uh, writing the long few report with uh, Connie Bakker. And it was that in developed countries, there's a rapid replacement cycle and that, um, yeah, there's a wasteful consumption pattern when we throw things away very easily. But we also discovered that in developing countries, the situation is different and you, you already have a lot of informal repair markets already. And it's also common to keep uh, products longer in use. Uh, so that's actually pretty good. And that's actually also the way uh, you want to uh, see it. Uh, so that's why um, I really also, yeah, one of the things I learned is that if we think about how you can reduce environmental impact in your country, um, and it's one of the reasons, of course, why we do circle economy is that you should always look at your own country and what's already there and what's already done there. Uh, this is an, another example. It doesn't have to do with circular economy, but for example, with uh, washing machines. If you want to make washing um, more sustainable, here in Europe, um, there was a campaign where they said, I prefer 30 degrees so that you have to wash more coal to do, uh, save energy for um, energy savings. But for example, in Japan, it's already a tradition to wash coal, so it doesn't make sense there. And uh, for example, here we also use drying machines where you could uh, save up energy, uh, those kind of things. But in other countries, it's very normal to just uh, let it uh, dry in the uh, the air. So, uh, yeah, what I want to say is that uh, it's very good that we are uh, sharing things and uh, it's very inspirational, uh, but we always should have to reflect how we can implement it in our countries. And of course, we can also learn a lot from uh, other countries worldwide. I've um, been to uh, uh, for example, I've been to places in Bali where they where I've seen that they use every part of the coconut was used. Uh, they uh, use the uh, the coconut flesh to eat, the water to drink it, the the skull to make uh, bowls out of it, the the hairs to make fire. Really, every uh, bit of um, the coconut was used, and I think that's uh, pretty circular. So I'm very glad um, that Fialetta also shared that they're reviving old wisdoms from Africa, because I think they're really um, yeah, great examples we can learn from each other internationally. Uh, so yeah, the question then is, is where in your country is the big win? And uh, yeah, you can do several things for circular economy. And of course, uh, an important part is also how you can use products longer with different business models. Uh, so you can um, yeah, save uh, materials. Uh, but if that's already done well in your country, for example, because there are uh, good repair markets already, uh, maybe you can also focus more on how you can close that loop and how you can regenerate uh, the resources and use it again. Uh, so I think um, yeah, there are very uh, different challenges internationally and we can learn a lot from each other. And we have already have great example uh, in the whole world uh, internationally. Uh, so, um, yeah, now to the three key learnings I learned so far. Uh, so um, we did a lot of uh, cases in Europe and what 
we really learned here uh, when working with companies is that you should always uh, start with um, yeah adding customer value so how can a circular economy also be um, more attractive to the end customer uh, that you should always start with mapping the opportunities so you can also see what the low-hanging fruits are and that you should um, experiment to de-risk things and i will um, explain all of these learnings a bit uh, more uh, by uh, also showing a case and the case i will now um, talk about is uh, Foriken. Uh, so Foriken uh, develops ferroing systems and they want to ensure that hundred percent of all newborn piglets have a happy and healthy life and they um, develop ferroing systems with a higher animal welfare um, so what you see is um, that they have uh, much more space in the fairing crates uh, to move. And one of the questions they um, had was, uh, how can we stimulate animal welfare and also circularity and sustainability at pig farms? Um, so um, that was one of the questions they had. And we um, did some research and uh, we looked at how they can take steps. And one of the first things we did was uh, seeing how a circular business can also start adding customer value. And uh, why is that? Well, this is um, already, uh, I think in the beginning, some five years ago when I was exploring um, circular economy uh, with my technical background, I uh, did my thesis on circular economy and I wanted to explore how we can, um, yeah, make products more circular. And then I already quickly discovered that if you start from a very technical perspective on how you can make products circular or more sustainable, uh, you always get the question back, yeah, but it will cost more because uh, you're de developing things for, um, for a longer time or it's not, um, it has to last longer or you have to extract parts and reuse it and all these things uh, will lead to a higher investment. Uh, so you will always get the question, um, but who is going to pay for these higher investments? So that's why uh, we at Inuboost believe you should always start with looking into what is the customer value so that people um, and the end um, of the user at the end of the value chain uh, will always um, yeah, also pay for these, this higher investment so that the business case makes sense. And so that uh, companies can also really implement um, the circular economy. Uh, so uh, the first things uh, we did uh, in the case for Freiken was uh, talking to uh, pig farmers to also um, yeah, see what they, uh, how they look at the transition to circular um, business model or circular products um, or becoming more sustainable. And what we found out is that uh, pig farmers still are dealing with loans from previous renovations. Uh, they already deal with high costs because of legislations while uh, they have to sell things at low prices in the global market. And uh, what they uh, told us is that if they want to make a change, then actually the entire value chain has to change. Uh, and that also the um, end uh, customer, the end consumer is still willing to pay more for it and not always choose for the cheapest products. Uh, so then we also thought about what the advantages are that circularity can uh, bring for the farmer. And we actually came on um, that modularity can be a very, um, yeah, a very useful for the farmer because uh, uh, modular flooring and modular products also allow you to transition when uh, you're ready in a smart way. So you see that the pig farming industry uh, has to shift to a more sustainable and um, um, more um, a system where there's more room for animal welfare. Uh, and it's also a, a push for legislation, but also more and more consumers are starting to ask for it. And if you want to deal with these higher investment in a smart way and want to be able to transition in steps because all these things cost a lot, uh, modularity can actually be a solution because then you can easily change things, you can grow through its things. And um, yeah, um, these slats, for example, if they are made well, they can last for 15 to 20 years. And now they were often produced in uh, one piece. And if you want to change your barn or renovate, you have to um, 
we are throwing things away and make it again. But modularity can actually be a solution uh, to grow and expand your farm or make your farm more sustainable, try out different floor pl plants. And more modularity can actually uh, help with that. Um, so we also looked into different business models at that time. And um, they are still now also uh, working on it. But one of the first steps is uh, actually yeah, launching these modular products and also see how people react to it. And uh, what customers, for example, now say is that they actually choose Varica because of these modular floorings, because they can use uh, reuse 80% of the slots and uh, they can change it to any uh, future plan. And it also allows them to really test what works before actually making a transition because they also have to keep uh, their uh, business alive. But now they can test things, see how it works. And if it works, they can scale up. So it actually helps um, in transitioning to um, yeah, better well-being for animals as well because they can uh, really test things, see how it works, imp um, improve it and implement it and uh, scale up. And another thing, uh, what we discovered is, uh, yeah, again, what I said before is that the entire value chain uh, will have to change um, if the farmers also want to become uh, more sustainable. Uh, because, yeah, it starts um, at the farm, but then it goes to the industry, it has to be packaged, all kind of things. And then at the end, the consumer decides what is paid for it, and all these things have to be uh, covered. Uh, so now they are actually uh, diving into um, a data passport to also track what happens in the value chains. And we uh, are linking it to the trend that uh, cons consumers want to know more and more what they are uh, what they are eating and want to know what happened to it and if it's healthy and those kind of things. And the data passport will actually uh, help with that. So this is how step-by-step step, um, they are, are using customer insights and consumer insights on um, how, yeah, circularity and sustainability can actually add value. Um, they are using that um, to become uh, more circular step-by-step. And uh, you have to also start step by step because um, small steps uh, lead to big change. This is as leads to what I believe. And um, uh, you need to start now because we don't have a lot of time. And if you already start now, you will um, more easily see uh, the opportunities that are all lying in front of you. Uh, so at InnoBoost, we have a tool for that. It's called the Risk to Opportunity Map. And you can see here what all kinds of steps you can take um, yeah, towards a circular economy or to more sustainable systems. And, and for example, if we would map it of uh, Farika, what they are doing is that, for example, now uh, they are already uh, looking at how you can uh, save with um, piglet feed or sow feed and how you can make reductions there. Uh, they're looking into a heat pump for the water bedding. They already have the modular flooring. They're looking at how they can separate manure and durin, and they're working on the data passport. And if you are mapping that and you have a session about what next steps you can take, you can, for example, say, oh, yeah, with modular flooring, uh, maybe with new installations, we can take all the old slats back and use it uh, again or uh, upcycle it into something different or if the manure is separated, maybe we can use it for the soil and uh, maybe we can put that, uh, that um, um, yeah, that fertilizer for the soil, um, keep, it, keep that local and produce it on our own farm and use it then at our own farm so we don't have the transportation costs. Or maybe if we have a data passport, we can go to um, other business models um, where um, consumers can actually choose to uh, have uh, products of a more sustainable uh, farm. And by mapping, you can see what uh, low hanging fruits are there. You can see what still needs to be done. And this also can help you pre prepare to see what kind of capabilities and knowledge you still have to develop. Because if you want to transition to um, a circular economy, or to a different, uh, more sustainable uh, system, you would also need um, different knowledge and different capabilities. And that's why Forica, for example, is teaming up uh, with um, 
a co or cooperative that owns the entire value chains of the production so that it's easier for them um, to make changes in that uh, entire chain from um, to the farm to the end consumer. Uh, and um, yeah, if you do this, um, this exercise, you will actually learn uh, what capabilities and what knowledge you still need to develop. And that's a start and it's a way uh, to get yourself uh, moving because if you keep doing that, um, you will always uh, take uh, great steps. And then um, if you are going to take uh, these steps, uh, you also need to look into how you can experiment uh, to re-de-risk re uh, things. And you just uh, have to do it. <laughs> and why uh, do you have to experiment? Uh, because uh, making it it's small helps you to get stakeholders along. So what you see in a circular economy is that it are often um, projects with a lot of stakeholders because the entire supply chain and value chain is often um, chopped into pieces everybody has a pit uh, a piece of the chain and um yeah you always uh, have to deal with um different considerations of all the stakeholders and if you can find a way to make it small and set it up as an experiment it will help to um, um take away assumption and it will help you to take steps uh, because what you see in innovation processes is that in the beginning it's a lot of um yeah researching things and analyzing things and it's a very messy process but once you are learning things it becomes um yeah more clear what the offer should be and you also want that your investments uh, uh suit with this so when the uncertainty decreases because you know and know more uh, you want that the costs in the beginning are low and that uh, while you know more, you can scale up and you can also um, yeah, uh, invest more in making the transformation and innovation actually happen. And uh, experimenting helps you to in this uh, fuzzy process and helps you also to get stakeholders along because you can just say, yeah, let's just try this for half a year or shorter and based on that, we take a next uh, step. Uh, so that's why at InnoBoost, we always uh, develop um, ideas and think about them. Then we make a list of with assumptions that we want to test. We experiment it with it in real life, and then we reflect from the outcomes and we learn from it and we do it again. And that's uh, how we see how we can make um, steps and really help companies um, to transition towards the circular economy. And uh, how can you test things? Well, this is not the case of Farika, but it's another example uh, of a company uh, we've worked with. Uh, for example, Mud Jeans, um, they wanted to lease the jeans so that they can uh, retrieve the jeans back and they can reuse it and then uh, make a new jeans out of it again. And they wondered how they can make leasing more attractive um, to customers uh, above owning their own jeans. Uh, so what we did is we developed um, several uh, propositions. So uh, why would a customer actually do this? And uh, we made two advertisements on it. So for example, if um, you have um, a subscription on a jeans and you're leasing it, uh, you can uh, want to also see that sustainability can, sustainability can be fun. So in this subscription, you get a lot of inspiration and tips on uh, how you uh, can do it. And in the other uh, one, um, um, we, it's more about uh, that you can also change uh, new clothing and you can uh, also go with uh, more latest trends, for example. And we had several propositions uh, based on this. And then we made uh, A-B testing on advertisement uh, where we just launched the advertisements on Facebook and um, we just um, looked at how people reacted to it so we could really choose a proposition that works the uh, best. And that's how you can uh, keep learning uh, step by step. Uh, so in summary, if you want to already start tomorrow and start exploring with the circle economy, there are already three things you can do. You can talk to your customer and see um, yeah, what they see as a benefit of going circular or uh, circular propositions. You can map the opportunities with your teams and um, the tools are freely available at innoboost.nl. 
uh, and you can set up your first um, experiment but tomorrow by actually also trying uh, something um, while keeping cost low. Uh, so if you want to know more, you can visit our website or go to the uh, book of uh, Circular Business of uh, my co-entrepreneur Christian Kreinhagen. And if you have questions uh, also later, feel free to ask now or feel free to send me an email at treitetinwooster.nl. Always uh, happy to share uh, knowledge and um, uh, teachings together. So uh, any questions? Uh, I think we have one question in the chat. So the question is, what impact do you see of EVs in the movement of circular economy across the world? What impacts? Do you see of EVs in the movement of circular economy across the world? Uh... Yeah, well, there, I think there are a lot of exciting things happening in circular economy and uh, a lot of companies are uh, taking steps and you have a great example for it, but it's all about how you can prolong the lifetime and um, yeah, there are a lot of examples to, uh, to, to tell you about, but, uh, but you mean the, the global impact or? Or, or examples or so China so I think China uh, uh, she is trying to understand the impact of uh, electric vehicles on oh electric vehicles yes. all right all right, all right. For electric vehicles right all right yeah I, I believe in uh, China there's a lot of things going on on electric vehicles already and uh they are, I think they're already uh, a step ahead also already because it's already uh, very common there to use uh, electric vehicles. Uh, but uh, in other countries as well, they are making uh, steps on it. And um, yeah, I think with that, the, the, the focus is on how you can um, restore, how you can charge the vehicles and keep them um, in the battery and actually and so that you can uh, really charge them up in a sustainable way. Uh, and what the global impact is, I, I actually don't know uh, 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 what the global impact is at this moment because uh, uh, electric vehicles is not one of the cases I did so far. And in the UN report, we focused on um, seven different other types of products so, such as washing machines, refrigerators and those kind of things. Uh, so, but this is what I know uh, so far. I hope that answers your question a little bit. So I think there is one more question, uh, Petya. Is there any other question? Uh, yes, there's one more. Uh, and the question is how uh, you come across some other structural changes that had to be done in order to have a higher acceptance of circular economy. So like standards, consumer rights and others. Uh, can I keep the... Maybe you can uh, look at the chat yourself. You can click on the bottom of your screen. But the, I can repeat it if you need to. Yeah. Hear it again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. have you come across some other structural changes that had to be done in order to have a higher acceptance of circular economy? So like standards, con consumer rights and other uh, well, I think if you want structural change, it also starts with a, um, also the culture at companies um, that you really have to integrate it into your strategy and those kind of things and that you are actually willing to experiment and do things. So I think that is one of the structural changes that is needed. And further, uh, yeah, in the, in the report, we looked more at uh, policy recommendations and those kind of things uh, in the UN report. And we looked at um, if you can make um, things more clear with uh, labels and those kind of things. So consumers also actually know what they are uh, choosing. Uh, but I think the most important thing, if, if we really want to make steps, is that uh, companies really also have to be um, open for it, implemented in their strategy, 
and that they can really um, set steps towards circular economy because they are open to experimentation. Thanks. Is that the structural change they, uh, they, they want to know more about or? Um, maybe yeah. we will get an answer, but thank you very much for all of your answers. Yes, thank you for the answer. Thank you so much, China, uh, for such comprehensive, detailed presentation. And uh, I think one of the key points that you highlighted during your presentation is the cultural factor, you know, that is very, very significant because there is a lot of difference between developing and developed nation and the way they use product and the kind of bond they develop with some entities over a period of time. Uh, by and large, it is seen that people in developing countries they don't like to discard any item. Instead of that, they would go get it repaired and reissue use it. Yeah. So I think these are small, small things, but very significant factors to understand cultural aspects in relation with circular economy as a fundamentals of circular economy. Thank you so much once again, Shaina. For yeah, I know, uh, I, I, know I, miss, uh, I heard the last thing. I, I now see it's consumer rights. <laughs> so I, I can still give a, a, one more example on it, but I don't know if you want to go further or uh, mm -hmm. on the question with the consumer rights of the structural change that we also saw as for example, that in France, uh, that they are actually um, trying to make a plant obsolescence uh, for example, um, 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 that you can, as a consumer, uh, uh, do a lawsuit against um, plants or obsolescence and those kind of things. And we thought that was a very good uh, point. Uh, and that you can, as a consumer, also actually, um, yeah, do something about that. Um, but yeah, we have to see uh, if that uh, is going to happen. But that was one thing uh, we found uh, in the report as well, what was a uh, very uh, inspiring structural change. Thank you so much, Shannon. Thank you so much. And right. Petra, if we don't have any other question, uh, if we could move on to our next presentation. Do we have any other question? Um, there's just one more. If there are any regulatory issues you have encountered, Mm, yeah, I think this very much differs uh, per industry uh, because I know from regular things there are, um, yeah, in every industry there are different um, things that people come across that sometimes uh, prohibit the circular economy. But again, in this too, I think you can only find out if you start to experiment and really start doing things and then have discussions about it together. Because if you don't start and don't do it, you never know. Uh, but if you um, experiment and you discover that in your country and you can uh, tell that to um, yeah, legislators or other parties that can play a role in it, you can uh, step, set steps together. Uh, but it really, um, yeah, that's, that really differs for countries so, and also for industries. So I would say uh, just experiment and just uh, start. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's all of the questions we have for now. All right, okay. great. Thank you, Shaina. Thank you, Patel. And uh, let's move on to our second presentation. And our second speaker is joining us from Romania. He is Matthew Greenlee, a versatile, motivated scholar who offers skill in research, strategic planning, and international project management. He has gained over 10, more than 10 years of ex experience in diverse professional uh, industries. He has also partnered with government and industry leaders to promote the circular economy concept and practice in Romania and throughout Eastern Europe. He has been Director of International Development and Cooperation at Institute for Research in Circular Economy and Environment, currently a Research Fellow at Circular Economy Research Center. So over to Matthew. Thank you so much, Rajni. And hello and good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you also to Eco Civilization for having me here today. And thank you, Cheyenne, for the interesting insights you just brought to us all. So I will begin now with this slide, just a second. Okay, 
So as Rajani mentioned a bit, my name is Matthew Greenley again, and I'm speaking here today on behalf of the Circular Economy Research Center at the Ecole des Ponts uh, Business School in Paris, where I am a research fellow. And on behalf of the Circular Economy Alliance, which I'll speak more about towards the end today, I will begin by discussing the current plan and recommendations brought by the European Commission for upskilling and reskilling. And I will then explain how our research center and the Alliance are working in parallel with that strategy to, to make this happen in the future. Okay, let's get started. So here, a glance at policy and education, the sunk cost of the transition. Okay, so as you may be familiar with the president of the European Commission's viewpoint at this level, uh, the main objective right now is to basically create a future ready economy uh, that is based on a new industrial strategy in order to become a world leader in circular economy and clean technologies in the future. And this is the goal again from 2019 to 2024 for the European Commission. As you may also be familiar about some of the strategies that have been in the past, uh, beginning with the circular economy plan that was in 2015 implemented, and the new ones that are for right now in 2020 and into the future, which is the circular economy action plan, as well as the European Green Deal, which are working in parallel together. As you can see here, these are different aspects of the European Green Deal. Um, all of them are important, if you can see in green, for example, increasing the EU's climate ambition for 2030 and 2015, mobilizing industry for a clean and circular economy, and all of the rest. However, the two that are most critical and that we will pay more of attention to, at least in today's thought, is financing the tra transition and also the leave no one behind. Uh, the main reason why we're putting most emphasis here is because of the fact that in order to accomplish all of the rest of the goals, financing and leaving the one behind and upskilling and reskilling uh, individuals is critical for the whole process to work of a circular economy. And also, this is a very interesting time period, especially to be looking more into research and innovation, uh, specifically with the Horizon Project for European Union funding. As you can see back in 1984 to 1987, there was about $3 billion worth of, 3 billion euros, sorry, worth of investment. And now in 2021, going into 2027, it's up to 100 billion. So this is really the time to start making this transition work. And different ways that can be done with this, you can find all of this information online and I also can provide it after this if anyone is interested. Um, but coming from the plan for accelerating the transition to the circular economy, some of the targeted actions we'll talk about here that are again from the European Commission and the European Investment Bank. So some of the main recommendations that are being suggested are for financial institutions to be involved as well as project promoters and policy makers. And to go into that a bit further, some of the specific recommendations that fall under this to the financial institutes and coming from them are, for example, circular economy project definition, taxonomy and measurements, absence of a credit risk assessment methodology fit for circular economy projects, addressing technology related risks in circular project or business and other factors that are influencing the bankability of circular economy projects and businesses as well. Additional recommendations that are for specifically to project promoters can be, for example, identifying new circular economy sources of revenue and or review the organization strategy, establishing collaborative arrangements across different organizations within and between value chains, and assessing and disclosing the environmental and social benefits, as well as developing internal capacity. And then recommendations specific for policymakers, again, in order to try to implement this green deal and then eventually get to the goal of the circular economy would be, for example, to create linear risk disclosure standards, create a definition of what a circular economy finance plan looks like, uh, to provide technical assistance for circular economy businesses, and dedicate financial institutes specifically for and instruments for the circular economy implementation. 
Recommendations to non-financial policymakers could involve, for example, development of a policy framework that is conducive to the circular economy and public authorities acting as facilitators of the circular economy. So with all this being said, specifically about terms of funding, we're going back to discussing about the Horizon Europe program that is again for research and innovation beginning in 2021 and going to 2027. So the decision of the Council on establishing a specific program and implementing Horizon Europe, the framework here is mainly in the idea of focusing on how to not only incorporate uh, different institutions and financial instruments, but also how to incorporate a digital transformation that can help to enable the process to be in a smoother and faster and more productive way uh, and transitioning to a low carbon uh, usage in general in order again to create the circular economy. Um, also competitiveness can reinforce each other through scientific and technological excellence. So by having this competition between different industries and institutes, it actually will help to bring the circular economy into a more structured way into the future. Um, again here, this is talking about also with circular industries. So Europe's industry should become a circular industry, meaning that the value of resources, materials, and products should be maintained much longer compared to today, evening up, even opening up new value chains, as also Cheyenne had mentioned before. Okay. So for business development, other aspects here could be, for example, a new generation of products and services in areas where Europe is particularly strong specifically with machinery, transport, cybersecurity, farming, the green and circular economy, healthcare, and high value added sectors like fashion and tourism. Again, these would be specific to Europe in this case, but each country has different specifications of what they will need to do to implement a circular economy. Uh, some countries, for example, may already have some practices that have been implemented in the past uh, that are already sustainable. So all of those aspects have to be taken note of when transitioning to the circular economy. Other aspects to talk about here. So in communication, shaping Europe's digital future. So for example, it should be a fair and competitive economy. For example, in the sense meaning that it should be digital again, global competitive with new industries as well as in the future and, and globally. Uh, including small to medium enterprises and the reinforcement of single market rules. Also, it should be an open and democratic and sustainable society. So again, we're not trying to close out other countries or other views, but rather to connect it all together in a global fashion. Okay. So now talking about another very critical aspect, and then I will discuss more about how our research center is actually integrating this in terms of skills and education in order again to upskill and reskill individuals. Okay. So part of this idea for the European skills agenda for sustainable competitive social fairness and resilience involves, for example, the twin green and digital transitions. This is basically talking about not that we're only using new digital technologies, but also we're integrating people and individuals into this process. So having them go together in parallel. Also, as we know, the pandemic has created many different problems, but it also has left the opportunity open to a new integration of better practices and more sustainable practices for the future. And it's the time for change. And digital skills have also been increased in this period of time as we're on a Zoom call now and not doing this in person, um, for example, and in many other aspects. And this is all helping to fulfill this future plan as well. Um, also, better access to vocational programs tailored to the twin green and digital transitions. And also in this sense to include digital, develop green products, services, and business models, create innovative nature-based solutions, and help minimize the environmental footprint of activities in general sense. And by having all of these and having an informed population and workforce that understands how to think and act green, it will make this process of a transition to a circular economy much more possible in the future. Okay, so. A bit further on here, talking about a pact for skills. 
So in this idea is to support and fair and resilient recovery and delivery on the ambitions of the green and digital transitions. And again, the main focus here is to upskill and reskill people in Europe. So instead of just passing away the people who have already been working in industries, we need to not exclude them and create unemployment, but rather to reteach them new skills that they can bring into the circular economy of the future. A bit more here about this would be in reference again to the labor market. So a resource efficient and circular economy requires a certain set of skills, knowledge and competencies. The transition to a more resource efficient and circular economy will not affect all workers at the same time or at the same way. Since jobs created and destructed are different, of course, it is never in the same sense. The terms of skills required and the types of tasks will be different. Understanding in advance where the skill and imbalances may arise, it's important to be able to upskill concerning occupational groups and to prepare them for the transition. Okay. Also, one last point here is despite a growing field of modeling literature on employment implications of a circular economy transition, research on skills requirements is also critical here for this transition and they are still scarce. Okay. And also, the idea of bringing more academia is critical here too, of course, for reskilling and upskilling, because if we don't have this research and we don't have this knowledge, it's impossible to show other people how to change the way that they're doing to and their practices to more sustainable levels in the future. So now I will talk a bit about our research center, the Circular Economy Research Center, that again is based in at the Paris Business School. And our main focus here at the current time is research in the sense that we are developing a curriculum for universities around the world, ideally in the future, because at this time, there is not a specific circular economy curriculum that university students can study. Many different people have studied different aspects of circular economy, but they come from different backgrounds. For example, I studied originally international development. Other people have studied policy. And then over time, we've learned different aspects across the years that are related to circular economy. But there isn't a, an exact curriculum that exists right now that is easily to understand and not going into super scientific levels. And so this is the main aspect that we're developing currently. And to go a bit further about it, as you can see, we're a business school within an engineering school, combining the best of both worlds working with executives that face real world problems helped us focus on orient our work we underline the fact that circular economy is not an exact science we strongly believe that circular economy if understood well and applied well respectively can significantly disrupt existing linear models and we also firmly believe that technological advancements as we've discussed in the past coupled with skills development will be two factors that will exponentially help to expedite the transition to a circular here you can see some of the members of our team that currently exist. Uh, at this time, as previously mentioned by Rajni, I'm in Romania. I'm actually originally from Florida, which would be nice during the winter to be there. Um, our main objective is eventually to all be together in Paris. However, at the time, we're all scattered across the world basically right now, with some of us being in Cyprus, some of us in Switzerland, some in the United States some in Paris, some in Italy. So right now it's a big divide, uh, mainly part of the due to the pandemic, but again, we hope this to be different, but it's very important to have expertise from everywhere in the world. And the last part that I will discuss today is about the other aspect that we have. So there's the research center and we also offer a circular economy alliance. With the circular economy alliance, the idea is that Many different people are working on circular economy projects and practices around the world, but however, it's not very clear and easy to find them when we need them, for example, for research or for project development. So our main goal right now is that we're trying to bring together these different entities into one alliance so it'll be easy to communicate. And the goal is not necessarily, for example, to, if it's an organization that already has a network, this is even more beneficial to the Circular Economy Alliance because again, it expands it to a larger group of people and knowledge. 
Uh, some of the names that we currently are working with, for example, have been IBM, the University of Cambridge, Piloti, uh, Telefonica. So a wide variety and we're still expanding at this time. And it's for free to join. And if anyone is interested, please let me know in the future and we can have a discussion about it and ways to go forward in this way. Uh, you can see my LinkedIn here, as well as my email address, and again, our circular economy website. Okay, so I will go back to here. If anybody needs, I can post this information again there. Okay, that is the part for what I have for the presentation. Uh, any questions at this time? I don't know, I haven't seen. Uh, yeah, we had we had one question during. So it's about if you are talking about employable skill sets or and not just general skill sets. I'm trying to look back through too. Yeah. Sure that was. Um, okay. So we are talking about employable skill sets and not just general skill sets. I think we're talking about both in this sense. So it's important, for example, to, to have a general knowledge of skills as well as specific ones that are employable. Um, as we transition to this circular economy or green economy, it will be necessary for people to obviously have high skills related to this. But at the same time, we're not trying to, again, create unemployment, rather, the companies and the industries that already have these employees need to put a focus on training them how to become more educated in these ways as innovation and the rest of prospecting. Ways that they can do this, for example, it seems very expensive and costly to retrain all of the employees in these types of skills or upskilling them and reskilling them. Um, but this is, again, where the funding is coming in from these projects. I mean, I've talked a lot about in terms of the European Commission, but there's many different funds that are all over the world right now for these projects, because one of the main pushes, even as you maybe have seen in the United States, is now, thankfully, to, to begin this transition. So more and more funding will come about this, and I think this would be the key in the future. I hope that answers some of it. Thank you very much. Uh, if we have another question, just go. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, of course. Hi, Matthew. Hi, this is Visna. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you say some examples of how digitalization can be applied for the circular economy to really promote the circular economy? Maybe if you can uh, yeah, say some examples that I can really imagine it, maybe like some projects or something. And the second question I would have is regarding the business model. So how can, uh, what would, uh, what is the biggest motive behind businesses to really implement the circular economy practices? So how to really encourage them? Is this really finances or are they really, you know, just because they want to be sustainable. So most of them, I don't believe so. So there has to be an, some additional push for them. And uh, if I may now, since I'm always talking, um, add one comment to the question about the EVs. So as uh, maybe you know that many countries already declared that uh, they want to, um, um, Mm, uh, eliminate the cars on diesel and gasoline. So some of the countries want to even set the goals, for example, until 2030, they won't be selling any of these kind of cars. So only hybrid and electrical vehicles. So of course, these electrical vehicles are gaining momentum. That's all from me. And uh, Matthew, thank you. If Yeah, please, if you will uh, reply me, thank you. Of course, yeah, each of them are kind of complex questions, so I'll try to answer them as we go through. Uh, so in terms of the first part with digitalization, actually in, in all processes, digitalization is going to be necessary in order to facilitate a circular economy. Um, I can give a couple of examples. This could be from smart energy system grids in order how to balance, for example, energy across uh, a city's design 
Uh, some aspects are considered about circular cities now where the entire city is operating under these digital systems. Um, because as you can imagine, you have to take in a lot of data for transportation systems, for energy, for water systems, for how everything is being used in a, in a resourceful way, basically not to waste. Um, think about it specifically, let's say with transportation and logistics. So you would need digitalization, for example, to reduce the amount of footprint that you have from the vehicles that are distributing supplies, for example. Um, you would need to know more information about you know, how to get to one point in the shortest amount of time, how to not put too many products or too many supplies in one truck, you know, to not create a big problem or how to make sure that you put enough in there, for example, and make sure that if there's a, if many of the different places that the distribution needs to take place or in the same area or in the same line, then it would be better, for example, to know that ahead of time instead of taking the distribution from one side of the town and back to the other and across, which also would reduce fuel costs as well and, and CO2 emissions. But hopefully, as you mentioned, also that in the future, more of these distribution systems will be using energy efficient vehicles as well. Um, in terms of energy efficiency and the vehicles, uh, one of the main aspects that I also am seeing is a big push is to having more of an influence on leasing uh, cars in the future, which will also reduce this uh, cost. And as smart cars become more and more available in cities, it'll be more possible, for example, that you could, like just as you would order an Uber or you would order, a, I don't know, another type of company or whatever, in Romania it's called Bolt also, uh, you could also potentially just go out to the street and get a smart car that is electric and this would be another way to reduce the amount of footprint and CO2 emissions and you could do this also using digitalization as well actually. Um, and the last question I'm trying to remember now is about the motive uh, for the companies to implement um, circular economy practices. Yeah, this is a really important question, actually. Uh, so I know, for example, by having worked many years in Romania, that it's very difficult to get companies interested in implementing these practices because in the beginning, it seems very expensive. Uh, this is really where the government has to get involved with policy changes. And in the European Union, for example, they are pushing to, to make this happen. Um, the way that it will be done here, for example, is that in the future, it will not be possible for you to, to not uh, comply. So companies will basically be forced to making green products and they will be forced again with these passport branding. And for example, if, uh, if another country in the future wants to import uh, or export products to the European Union, they will have to comply to these regulations of creating them in a more sufficient and sustainable way. Otherwise, they will pay a higher tax. So this is one option and the same that this way it keeps the industry in a more sustainable fashion globally. So to answer your question, for sure, policy change has to happen. Otherwise, people will not be interested. You also have to educate people from the beginning with circular economy practices, meaning from uh, pre-school to, you know, through higher education through their entire lives. Uh, Finland is a good example of this where they are actually already implementing this in education systems across. So then you have people more aware about these practices from the beginning. This makes it easier to create the policy changes. Then it makes it more appealing for the companies to apply for funding for investments to create these green products and continue this circular economy. I hope that answered some of it. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Thank you, Matthew, really. Yeah, no thank problem. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all of your answers. I think that's all of the questions we have right now. So I think, Rajini, we can continue. And thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Thank you, Petia. And thank you, Matthew, for excellent inputs and stupendous presentation. And it's time to move on to our third presenter who is joining us from Poland, Agata Frankwich. She's founder and CEO of Deco Eco and Circular Economy Expert, of course. She's a passionate leader with a clear vision of success, has a unique mix of 
competences in marketing, advertising, design, and circular economy. Currently running a fast growing company, decoeco.com, an upcycling platform which cooperates with local designers to convert companies based into well designed consumer products. Experience in marketing, advertising, and CSR projects for companies like Bose, Bacoma, Hoop Cola, Pole Pharma, McDonald's, IKEA, Oren, T Mobile, and many others. So the floor is all yours, Agatha. Thank you very much for this uh, beautiful and warm <laughs> welcome. Uh, I'm happy to, to share uh, um, our idea of, uh, of circular economy. Uh, I will present uh, to you, first of all, the business model of, uh, of, uh, of, the market, of, of our marketplace, because I think it's, it's uh, itself the business model is a great example of circular economy to share and inspire but i will also try to show you a few business cases that we uh, we've done um, so far with our clients uh, to give you more insight into uh, into how we are um, pursuing the circular economy uh, principles uh, so let me share the screen okay can you see the presentation yes we can see. Okay, I cannot. Oh, yeah. Mm, okay. Uh, all right. So, um, so yeah. My name is Agata Frankiewicz. I'm founder and uh, and CEO of uh, Deco Eco. Uh, I'm also uh, a circular economy expert and consultant. Uh, my journey with circular economy started uh, over seven years ago actually, uh, or even a bit earlier. Uh, and it's funny because uh, actually I found the inspiration to, to change my uh, professional career from marketing and, and brand strategy into circular economy, inspired uh, by, um, by, uh, my, um, to, by traveling in Asia. And that's, uh, that's funny because I didn't find the inspiration of upcycling and, 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 and of circular economy in Poland, uh, my hometown, uh, my home uh, um, uh, market, but very, very far away when I was traveling um, uh, actually in Cambodia. Uh, and what really inspired me that um, there, there was a very interesting entrepreneurships, uh, entrepreneurship spirit as um, there were the whole uh, villages, uh, the, the whole families and even villages were making uh, products, uh, touristic products from a uh, local cement factory from cement bags, used cement bags. And this was amazing because these were products which, which were made from uh, from the material which is worn out, uh, which is, uh, there is a full of these materials on the streets uh, uh, and um, in the local um, uh, factory uh, of the cement. Um, and these uh, products uh, were having the characteristic elephant uh, logotype. And it, it really inspired me because um, because the, on the markets of the of Cambodia, you, you, you were able to find a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, touristic gifts and products out of these materials. Uh, I bought a lot of them uh, to my, for my friends. I really like the products. Um, but um, then um, I started to think that um, in Europe, we are struggling to be 100% circular. Yeah. And we really want to speed up with uh, with the um, uh, with the circularity, with with turning to, to to new business model, more innovative thinking about waste. Uh, so maybe we should learn a bit um, uh, from the uh, small entrepreneurs uh, in uh, in Cambodia, which where where there is not that, or at least at that times there was not that um, um, specific system of upcycling or recycling in place and they are making such amazing products consumer products out of waste materials and they can make a living uh, on that so uh, i was uh, it was the time when i met uh, when i um, approached the, the met the upcycling uh, trend and decided to uh, to um to build something uh, that's gonna uh, inspire <laughs> like these entrepreneurs inspired me. So this is how uh, the Coeco um, um, was born. <laughs> A few years ago, I, I started uh, the Coeco uh, with the e-commerce for upcycling designers, upcycling, so the ones who are making 
consumer products uh, from uh, different kinds of waste materials. Uh, first of all, I started with uh, e-commerce platform. Afterwards, uh, the business model was evolving and we end up with the um, uh, B2B circular marketplace, which is matching uh, upcycling companies from all over the world, uh, mostly from Europe, with uh, global clients, partners, uh, businesses who are having uh, an excessive waste materials and are looking for more innovative ways to uh, utilize them to, to reveal the full potential of waste. So this is uh, DecoEco. In DecoEco, we help companies to transform their waste into value. We are actually giving the highest value jump from zero to a product by cooperating with the widest range of upcycling and recycling partners. Uh, we are right now a Polish and Dutch uh, company, uh, but uh, we are also scaling up to other European countries, having uh, first clients in uh, Germany, Austria, Scandinavia. Uh, actually, even um, even in Philippines, uh, we were uh, in uh, talks uh, with Unilever Philippines, so also uh, on Asia. Um, mm, we all know what's the problem. Uh, waste is a huge global problem. Uh, we all uh, know um, how many plastic is in the oceans uh, and up in, in the oceans. We we all know how uh, how much ineffective we are in uh, managing and using the natural resources, but also managing and using waste resources. Um, we uh, are striving to be 100% circular in the next um, uh, years, uh, but uh, the uh, according to circularity gap report, uh, which was done with um, uh, with Net um, in Netherlands, our world is currently only nine percent circular, which means that uh, that actually only in nine percent the, the the materials we are producing are. Uh, becoming coming back to the uh, to the um, uh, um, uh, the global economy. Um, nowadays, only thirty to forty percent of the types of waste materials can can be recycled. So, if we would like to really take care of of of, of uh, waste materials properly, uh, there is a huge need need of collaboration and innovative thinking. Uh, giant companies, uh, be the biggest comp corporations, are also um, uh, striving with the biggest challenges, uh, like new uh, European Union regulations, raising uh, waste disposal disposal uh, costs. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know um, if you realized that uh, currently uh, the. Um, the cost of uh, recycling um, uh, in global corporations um, uh, are uh, around 5% of this company's annual revenues. Uh, mm, also, the companies are having a bigger and bigger brand credibility as uh, mo most of the consumers are now um, uh, have now a growing awareness around sustainability and they are expecting actually from uh, from their um, um, most favorite brands to be more circular. So we could say that every global company is facing now the challenges of how to become circular and how to reveal the full potential and the full value of their waste materials. Uh, that's why uh, we uh, designed, we designed a solution uh, which uh, would help in uh, speeding and easing the circular collaboration between smaller partners like reupcycling partners and bigger companies who are having a budget and, and who wants to introduce more and more innovative solutions. Um, that's why we are also using upcycling, uh, which is like transforming waste into profit by giving by giving the highest value jump. So uh, like adding bigger value to, to the waste. Um, uh, in our uh, offers, in our business model, we, we do um, so-called brand upcycling because we are not just helping companies to get rid of the waste, but also we are helping them to build a real circular brands. For example, by introducing new upcycling product lines, 
uh, at the market. Uh, and this is how it, um, uh, how it works. Uh, so in order to provide more circular uh, solutions and to speed up the uh, collaboration and processes between innovative companies uh, and bigger industries, bigger companies, we introduced uh, the first uh, online B2B marketplace. Uh, the marketplace is connecting designers from around the world who can turn waste into products with the companies who are owners uh, of um, uh, waste. Um, our proposition uh, for, for the clients uh, is actually based on two angles. The first one is the marketplace that I just mentioned. And the second one is also direct consulting and services. So in case of individual inquiries or really non-started waste streams or like longer term uh, projects like closed loop reverse logistics projects or open loop collaboration projects, we are also dedicating our staff and our consultants to, um, uh, to the project. Um, the marketplace um, is a very interesting um, platform uh, in which we have two main groups of users, but actually we could say three target groups. So in terms of users, on the one side, we have the designers, which, call, which we call waste upcyclers. They can uh, register their uh, accounts to the marketplace. Uh, they can put those uh, waste needs. They can put these products that they are making to the database, uh, to the e-commerce. Uh, and on the other side, we have the second users, which are business clients, which we call them waste providers. So they are uh, the companies who can upload the waste streams to the marketplace. They can um, find the, uh, the right partners to convert those waste, or they can find inspirations for that. Uh, so designers and business clients are our main user, uh, the main users uh, and target groups of the marketplace, but also the products that are being uh, uh, made that are being done out of the uh, this collaboration uh, are consumer products. So at the end of this uh, cycle, uh, we have consumers because the consumers are, are the, the the end users of the product, which are made um, from the waste provided by. Uh, companies. Uh, Marketplace has really interesting functionalities. Uh, I would advise you also to, to go into uh, decoeco.com uh, webpage and you can also see how it how it works. So uh, we have a few main functionalities of the platform, which are, for example, smart matching, intelligent browser. So our vision is to create a full ecosystem and a and a huge database with all sorts of waste materials, all sorts of the products that can be done out of the particular waste materials. And we want to match this very quickly. So let's say if the company has some need of creating a product out of, of, out of waste or have some excessive waste materials that they want to find out what might be the other uh, ways to utilize this, uh, they can have a look at our smart matching browser and they can see, okay, if I have such kind of waste with such a localization, there can be such ways to utilize that. Afterwards, they can request a prototype, they can ask for role pricing and start uh, cooperation thanks to the marketplace. Uh, business uh, accounts, business companies also can upload the waste to the system. And thanks to that, designer can pick up the waste. So we can boost the development of smaller companies, which not necessarily having um, uh, easy access to uh, waste materials that they need to produce their own products. Uh, another really nice functionality is create a challenge. And the create a challenge is like organizing contests uh, among designers for a specific uh, problem that a particular company have with uh, their waste. And last but not least, a uh, very interesting thing is um, a shopping shop in which uh, we can co-create the upcycling um, collection of products. And these products can be sold to employees of a particular company or they can be sold to, to, to a consumers via our uh, e-commerce. Uh, so currently we, we are observing that more and more companies are interested in cooperation with the marketplace. And these are um, three types of companies. So uh, first of all, these are companies who have waste and want to upcycle them for their internal goals. For example, they need more sustainable corporate gifts or Christmas gifts for those employees or some products for use, used for sales or marketing purposes. So they can, they can instead of ordering a new ones and producing a new 
materials from from natural uh, resources they can just upcycle their waste uh, companies uh, say, b second companies are the companies that have waste but not necessarily needs upcycling products but they would like to get rid of them in more circular manner so for example they can contribute to a circular economy by passing the waste to the company which is producing a product from this kind of material let's say with the plastic for example so there is a company a who is having a lot of um, uh, uh, pat plastics or other forms of plastic and other companies creating some products out of that and in um, uh, and the third companies are the companies who doesn't have waste but want to have upcycling product lines or need to have the waste to these production processes um, we also do some consultancy and services, uh, uh, for example, the initiation package in which our consultants are doing a full um, a full uh, analysis uh, analysis of the waste materials um, from a particular company to point out the uh, upcycling potential for the for the waste or activation package in which in three steps uh, analysis, smart matching and prototyping we can uh, create some prototypes with our uh, designers from a particular waste tree. Uh, so this is a, a short story about Teco Eco and about the marketplace. I think it's also quite interesting how such platform, matchmaking platform with a consumer focus uh, can really boost um, the collaboration processes, which is really needed in the circular economy to make it happen um, uh, really, really faster. Uh, I would like to show you a few examples because maybe when I'm <laughs> talking about the business model, it might be um, a bit uh, maybe complicated and confusing sometimes. So I would love to show you what uh, what our designers are doing and what kind of product product projects we are uh, making um, via our marketplace. Um, before I'm gonna show you a few examples, a few words uh, um, with whom we are cooperating. So currently on our marketplace, we have actually almost 300 upcycling designers from 16 different countries who are dealing with more than 65 types of different kinds of waste materials. And we are cooperating with such clients like uh, Orange, uh, T-Mobile, McDonald, IKEA, Coca-Cola, Canon, National, Netherlands, and from Poland, Netherlands, Germany, Austria, our Scandinavian uh, markets. Uh, and a few examples, so how it works. <laughs> this is a great example of plastic upcycling. Plastic upcycling is like a, is a, um, is a very, very fast uh, uh, growing trend uh, nowadays all over the world, especially when, uh, when there is such a, a wide media attention and, um, and business attention to plastic waste, which is, which is crucial right now. So we are, uh, we, one of the examples is, is um, the project that we did for Coca-Cola uh, here. Uh, we, are, we were cooperating with this designers from all over the Europe uh, that proposed um, a few uh, consumer products uh, like um, these um, everyday use uh, products like clocks or, or baskets made uh, with um, uh, inclusion methods, compression methods, and also this bench that you can see this was a bench which was used in the local uh, parks um, on the streets of Amsterdam and um, um, Yes, in Amsterdam and Amsterdam and in Greece. Uh, so these these are benches with, which are done with the uh, 3D uh, printing um, uh, methods. Uh, you can see more photos uh, out of uh, out of that. Uh, uh, this is also another great example on how it uh, works. So a McDonald's in Poland turned uh, to us uh, that they have um, tons of old plastic. Uh, toys from Happy Meals and they uh, are having problems with recycling that. So uh, because this is like um, non-homogeneous mainstreams and not that big to, to, to go with that to recycling companies and it's not cost effective to do uh, typical recycling with that. So what our designers do, did, so first of all, we, we create a challenge among designers and designers uh, were like uh, connecting with us, proposing uh, the products that, uh, that they're doing from such kind of plastics. Uh, meanwhile, we were doing a profound analysis of the materials. Mm -hmm. It turned out that the materials need to be separated, sorted out and converted into a granulate. After the granulate was, was made, it was a pure material that some of the designers uh, could uh, use uh, for the production of 
new products and um, the most interesting products that McDonald's was um, uh, was taking into account uh, are the trays uh, to the restaurants. So the, the, the old plastic uh, was converted into a product that might be used again in a McDonald's restaurants. And the uh, second thing was the benches uh, that uh, could be outside uh, McDonald's restaurants. Uh, just a quick glance because I know that my time is running out. So just a quick um, a glance of uh, another example. These are, for example, uh, cups and um, uh, flower pots made from coffee grounds. So uh, a bio circular economy solutions. This was made for a retail chain, uh, Shapka in Poland. Another example, these are more like consumer oriented. This is a collection of products for a shopping shop for Heineken Experience Museum shop in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, um, another example, this is a collection of products from Electroways from old to uh, mobile phones from Orange. And this was used actually for education campaigns about electro waste uh, that Orange was using um, um, two years ago. Um, so um, this is all in terms of, of my presentation, but I'm happy to uh, answer uh, the uh, possible questions. Thank you, Agatha. And uh, greatly appreciate the presentation uh, you made. Oh, stop, sure. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, we have a few questions. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name from Himanshu from mm -hmm. India. Okay, and she's asking if you are speaking of uh, speaking of recycling waste products, how processed food waste can be brought in circular economy. Uh, so, yeah, what, once again, uh, I'm not yeah, sure. So how mm -hmm. can the processed food waste be brought in circular economy? Food waste? Yes. Okay, so... <laughs> yeah. yeah, processed food. I think processed food is the main difference. You know, food and processed food are two difficult processes to recycle and uh, to bring them back in circular economy. So his question is more related to processed food and bringing it back in circular economy. Okay, I'm not sure if I understand correctly the, the naming of the processed food, but I, I guess I, uh, that the question is about the food waste, yes? That's uh, how to, yes. Yeah. So we have, uh, for example, uh, also in our marketplace, we have quite a lot of, uh, in our network, uh, quite a lot of designers who are designers, we, we call them designers, but these are actually very upsetting partners who are also creating some products um, from, um, from um, for example, food waste. And one of the examples were, were maybe I will take these examples uh, that I showed already, uh, are the coffee grounds or the uh, orange peels, yes? So there is a lot of uh, places like restaurants in which there is a lot of, uh, a lot of waste, uh, for example, from oranges, yes? Because uh, the, co the restaurants are making, um, let's say the, um, the uh, because, because I will answer this question, of course, from my perspective. Perspective, yes, uh, from the perspective of upcycling, because I, I guess that there's a lot of enormous uh, different kinds of ideas for food waste, but I, I will maybe answer from, from my own uh, perspective. Uh, so in terms of the upcycling, uh, this is um, amazing how many companies are turning old waste materials from the, for example, restaurants into new uh, products like these coffee grounds pots or, or other coffee grounds products. Uh, also, there is uh, in UK, for example, there is a lot of uh, small companies, but also bigger ones uh, who are uh, taking the food waste straight from the farmers or from the local local farmers, and they are turning them into um, into cosmetics. So, so there are new uh, raising companies, upcycling companies who are making in the UK cosmetics from the food waste from the local farmers. Yes, or or there is a lot of uh, ideas on um, how to. Um, do some um, um, material like a textile uh, that could be used to, to produce, uh, let's say, shoes uh, straight from the um, apple um, um, apple uh, peels. Yes, so there is more and more solutions in which the the, the uh, part of food waste also might be converted into new products. So this is the, the answer from, from the, the upcycling uh, point of view. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for any developing nation, capital investment is one of the biggest constraints 
for introduction of circular economy solutions, synthesizing such nations is definitely a challenge. Any possible way to quickly sanitize or motivate such nations to invest more in circular economy? So this is this question because I have I, I'm like a, I prefer to. So the question is from Himanshu Chopra, yes, for any yes. developing nation. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I will have a look uh, quickly because this is quite the broad questions mm -hmm. for any developing nation. Okay. Yeah, it's very, very broad uh, question, like how to uh, motivate, uh, I mean, the governments, yes, to, to put more money in circular economy. This is what I understand, uh, or the question, yes, what could be the incentive? Do, do I understand correctly? Uh, maybe um, you can help me with the... Yeah, that's <laughs> right, question that's about... right. Manchester mm -hmm. said that's right, so yeah. How to get the government... Uh to invest more in circular economy. And then when nation consumer to add the profit, we have That's right, you can go. I, I'm not the expert of, to be honest, of the, you know, uh, of the governmental field, but um, I think that um, all these regulations and legislations that are already in place, for example, I, I know from the perspective of Europe, yes, European Union is putting a lot of uh, regulations currently more and more imposing on uh, on the countries um, and the governments of, of the particular European Union members uh, a need uh, of uh, introducing circular economy principles. So I think that uh, that this is one thing. Yes. Yeah? So so like some some. Um, pressure from the like um, global institutions uh, but secondly of course the consumer uh, this is like the, the consumer driven market yes we live in the uh, totally consumption uh, world so we all know that like everything what we consume and we are deciding as consumers so so that there's also i think the um, like growing consumer awareness and motivating consumers and giving incentive to consumers to buy uh, products or educating uh, consumers about how important it is to is to buy and choose a more circular or sustainable product rather than maybe cheaper but uh, uh, product done by mass uh, production methods. I think this is as well something which which um, um, might help in the whole process. Yes. Um, I'm not a, the expert of the of the government. I was never advisor for govern, governments. I, I was, uh, I, I am more advisor and consultants for like businesses and and companies, smaller and, and bigger ones. But I think that both of them, the regulatory, but also the pressure from the consumers, uh, are the the best uh, the best uh, motivation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next question is from Ashish. Would you like to place it uh, by speaking? Because you said you have a question on man manufacturing waste. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Uh, oh, it's uh, better to hear you know, the, the questions. <laughs> so I can ask about some ambiguities if I'm going to have. Yeah. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, go ahead. What's your question? Talking of you know tons and tons of the municipal waste which is generated in uh, many of the locations in the country, and you know we have uh, this problem of plenty. A lot of tons and tons of wastage is generated, and I think uh, what we have to make it a sustainable and a viable business model for the companies or the government to invest. Because people, once they see the volume, they pull their foot back and they say, okay, no, we cannot handle this amount of tonnage of wastage. So we have solutions, but I think, you know, we are looking for the scale, much larger scale. You gave some good and very interesting solutions on the circular economy. So I really am really wondering how we really put it as a business case to the, you know, people to come forward and make it more sustainable. And then we are able to get some portion of this problem addressed. I'm talking of the municipal waste, which is generated from residential societies, industries, houses, and every sort of thing where the human life work exists. I hope uh, the question is clear to you, Agatha. Uh, I'm not sure. Who, so what, what's the question <laughs> itself uh, about the municipal waste? This is what I understood. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. what exactly is the question? I'm looking at how, how you make it more sustainable model, you know, because the volume of wastage generated is very high. 
And, yes. Uh, so we are asking about start. this scaling or like the, the yeah, volumes scaling. of the pro yeah, production yes. of yes. our partners. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so of course, uh, I showed you just a few examples. Yes. And not uh, all of them were like uh, small scale. Uh, so uh, th there is a lot of, um, for example, in our marketplace, yes, or, or in the network that we are um, building, uh, there are different kinds of companies and, and um, um, generally in, in, the, in the field of upcycling uh, companies, uh, there are different kinds of companies. Yes, there are, of course, the smallest ones, like more uh, do-it-yourself things or products that are like rather small scale, <laughs> um, for example, which companies are buying for, the, for their own brand purposes. So this is not that significant in terms of, of turning into circular economy, but it gives like more education and more and more awareness, which is also important to, to educate consumers, yes, because it's, it's, it's really good to, to give a product out of waste uh, instead of, uh, let's say, educating uh, in paper, yes. But also on the upcycling market, uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, we could say, like re-upcycling companies. So, so these are companies which are dealing with a, a much bigger uh, scale. For example, in plastic upcycling that I mentioned, uh, we have a lot of partners who are dealing with like tons, tons of waste. So, so this is not that, uh, uh, that um, difficult to find such uh, examples or, uh, or we have, uh, for example, textile uh, uh, recycling or textile upcycling. Uh, so, so upcycling is part of recycling. So, so this is, um, uh, there is a lot of uh, also uh, mass, um, mass solutions. Um, of course, in Deco Eco, we are concentrating more on, on the, on the uh, corporate waste. So um, that's why the products that we are showing are more like uh, corporate oriented. But uh, there is many, many solutions, um, like the mass scale solutions. Um, but the important thing is that in such a process in which we need to create a product, so upcycling as a product from the waste materials, there is a need of a long cycle of partners. So the upcycling designers might be like at the end of this uh, of the whole chain, but on a way you you need to find some recycling partners to to uh, to create um, um, uh, first the material, then after out of material you can create products and so on. So. So this is a matter of finding the right partners and, and of the um, collaboration between different uh, parties uh, and very quickly finding the right partners. That's why the, the, this matchmaking uh, that our marketplace is doing is, is that important uh, to find the right partners to, to manage the whole process, yeah. So I, I think that the, also it's like every other market that there are like small players, but also bigger uh, scale players. And the same is like with the upcycling companies. Yeah, thanks Agatha, you explained yeah. it very well. Uh, yeah, got the point Thank of you. You know, doing the matchmaking. Yeah, let's stay connected on this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you Ashish for asking this question. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one more question from Shivani, uh, it's what are some efficient ways to set up waste collection for small and mid-sized organizations? What are efficient ways to set up waste collection? Mm -hmm. uh, we are sometimes also designing some waste collection systems uh, for, the, uh, for global uh, companies. And mostly they are using uh, their own chain of partners. So this is all about <laughs> partners uh, in the chain. Yeah? So, so for example, if we have a L'Oreal or, or such a kind of company that has uh, selling, for example, selling consumer goods, uh, I know that they are organizing the collection systems, for example, in those retail chains. Um, and what is important here is like a good incentive and good motivation and good communication towards consumers. Yes, because these are the consumers who are collecting uh, the product. So, so we, we were designing um, some of the collection system uh, for the retail chains, for example. Uh, however, there is a great example of the um, of another uh, company uh, acting in circular economy. I think one of the biggest uh, biggest company in this field, which is great, doing a great uh, collection system. This is TerraCycle. I don't know if you, if you if you if you've heard probably yes about Terra 
TerraCycle uh, led by Tom Shaki. So TerraCycle um, introduced a great collection system in which they are cooperating with each um, uh, with a lot of corporations and they are creating a special divisions. So for example, they have a division for collecting shampoo bottles, yes, from Garnier or L'Oreal. And they put the loyalty system in place in which um, they, they, they have the logistic partner. This is the whole chain of, of, of the company, which is like making these logistics. They are picking up uh, the, uh, the, if you're a consumer, you can subscribe to a collection system online and you get the box. And once the box is full, the logistic partner is taking this box and it all goes to the TerraCycle magazine. And once they collect enough amount of, of these waste materials, they are converting this for, for some products and consumer can take the loyalty point, they can pay with these points and so on. So this is a full, really nice collection system um, with a loyalty program for consumers. You can you can go and check TerraCycle, how it works. So this is one of the best, I think, examples uh, currently that I had uh, about the collection systems. Um, um, for the for the waste. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh -huh, there's she. Okay, the uh, answer was uh, understood. And thank you very much for your presentation. I think that's all of the questions that we have. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Um, Hi, good day. Thank I you have very one much. Question. Yes. Hi, this is Alicia Shepherd. Good day. I'm not sure what time it is where you are, but it's um. 11.45 here in the morning. And um, the question for Agatha is, um, all right, so many of us believe that the way of the future for solution building is housed in user innovation, many of which will end up in the creation of small and micro and medium-sized industries. Many of these industries or enterprises um, rather will not have the tools to upcycle. What ways do you think that larger companies can um, act in order to provide user innovators with the tools that they can innovate in small and micro um, and medium-sized enterprises in order to perhaps uh, sell these ideas that they can be scalable in larger companies? Yes, this is a very good question, Alicia. Thank you very much. And actually, this is also based on the idea that we had, like when we were uh, uh, when we were creating the the, the whole uh, platform. In uh, in terms of the, uh, we are asking about the hour. So now it's five, and I I I, I think that you're <laughs> you're seeing that my uh, background is like getting darker and darker. I think that I need yeah. to switch on the light. Just yeah, like I more. noticed. You know, I should <laughs> Maybe I should switch on the light very soon. Sorry for that. It was quite light, much more light 15 minutes ago. But answering the question. So, uh, so yes, this is a really good question because uh, I also believe that uh, that small innovators, small companies, this is the, the future of the new circular economy and of new era of recycling because recycling is the, doing, doing a great job. But this is, uh, this is like... Uh, like huge banks, uh, uh, which was uh, interrupted, which, which was, um, uh, you know, uh, suddenly uh, interrupted by the fintech industry and small uh, companies, startups, innovators who started to revolutionize the old financial uh, sector. Yes. And this is the same is happening right now within the recycling industry. So we've noticed that recycling industry uh, is not having uh, enough solutions uh, for 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 waste, and we are like, uh, okay, we we, there, we have recycling companies, and we think everything is fine, but it's not. I'm not saying that recycling companies are bad; they are doing they are doing a great job. But there is so many uh, um, waste materials that cannot be proceed by current methods because it's not ho non homogeneous or or not enough quantity, or we need a really huge like um, uh, and expensive methods uh, in place. To, to recycle uh, these kinds of waste materials. So, so I really believe that the small entrepreneurs and, and the small companies who are starting with really small methods, actually I was observing this through the years of running the marketplace that we started with really small B2C consumers, B2C companies, peer-to-peer -peer companies, and they grew up uh, having projects um, done for bigger uh, corporations. Uh, so uh, so um, it's... Um, 
um, it's 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 quite important, and I think that the the big companies have a lot of tools to to deal with that. Most of all, they have budgets, and they're really, really looking for more innovative ways to uh, recycle. Uh, there is a lot of uh, accelerators and pilot projects uh, in which uh, smaller companies can take a, take the um, challenge and uh, try to cooperate with business clients. And during such accelerators and pilot projects, uh, they can um, design some uh, new uh, uh, new products and and to work on more scaling uh, more scale up um, uh, projects uh, if the company see the potential in such a small company they can invest yes uh, in this company um so I think I, I think that, um, for example, yes, yeah, Stora Enzo. Uh, this is the the one of the they, they are doing, for example, nice accelerators in which they are uh, working on a plastic free supply chains or bio circular economy by uh, choosing uh, smaller companies to cooperate with them. Um, so yes, yeah, so so I think that there is a lot of um, a lot of um, methods like like these accelerators or pilots um, to to help uh, to grow uh, the smaller scale into 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 larger uh, scale uh, companies in this um, field. Thank you, Agata. <laughs> Thank you very much and thank you all for participating tonight. As said before, uh, the tape will be published on our page ecocivilization.eu and you can also access it on our Facebook page ecocivilization. Maybe Rajni, do you have any final words? Uh, greatly appreciate the presentation you gave Agatha and incredibly informative and interesting answer that you gave of all questions. Uh, that have been put up to uh, today and uh, like i said in the beginning of uh, the webinar that the purpose of organizing this particular webinar which is based on circular economy application is to generate awareness that could lead to innovation sustainability and resource efficiency because only this let me reiterate only this can save life on earth of yours mine and of everyone's so before I wrap up this session, I would like to ask Violeta ma'am and all participants if they have final word to say anything. No? Well, if nobody else, uh, uh, Ranji, I would like to uh, say just one or two sentences. First of all, thank you to you for really picking excellent speakers again. Thank you very much. Thank you, the speakers. Uh, you keep proving that a circular economy is no longer just a goal or a strategy, but it's a very tangible tool to, uh, to find new jobs, to find new business opportunities, uh, and to co-create uh, the society with a new values at its core. I mean, we are understanding that even if we recycle, if we reuse, if we extend the livelihood of products, we are not destroying our economy. We are not really destroying our societies, but we're just giving it even stronger meaning and bringing us even closer together uh, and changing our attitude towards limited resources, towards more responsibility and more really holistic view of a relationship between us humans and the rest of the laws of nature. I mean, we often forget that we are nature uh, and that these laws of nature apply to us as well. And these are the, the right steps uh, also towards our this new uh, destination, which listening to you, it's become more and more of a reality. Uh, the eco-civilization where a circular economy, uh, we are envisioning at its core, at one of the basic relationships that brings us together, while refocusing our organizational attention no longer to functions as we're used today, but to beings where people are part of it, towards societies, uh, different types of communities that we form together, towards land that is feeding us all and holding space uh, for us to exist, and the collective uh, collective consciousness, which is the whole wisdom that we are accumulating, including with today's speakers. Um, and these should 
I propose, I invite you to consider, and let's have a discussion at one point on that as well, is that these could be the organizational blocks of the future connected with the high quality relationships where circular economy is one of them. So thank you very much to all of you. And uh, thank you uh, also Petia for your uh, debut. Uh, you've been uh, supporting us technically for the first time. So everything went smoothly. So thank you very much. Uh, Ranvi, back to you. Thank you, Valeta, and thank you, Petia. And thank you all speakers for such insightful presentations today. It has been really a learning and knowledge packed session. Thank you everyone for being with us today. We truly appreciate you being here. And don't forget to join our next webinar on circular economy, which is scheduled on March 10th, same time. And uh, let me end this uh, wonderful event on a great quote by William Arthur, who said, the pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist expects it to change, the realist adjusts the same. So guys, thank you once again for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Till then, take care and bye. Thank you as well. Okay. Take care. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajni. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Agatha. Thank, thank you. all participants.